All right. So when we first encountered Stuart Althorpe's Reagan Library, we were befuddled. The first page, headlined by a mist-like image, read, were you dreaming? What do you think you're reading? Do not attempt to reconfigure your browser. The whole thing seemed inscrutable. There was no navigation, only underlined words signaling hyperlinks, but to where? As we clicked through Reagan Library, it became more and more inscrutable. As we were transported through four color-coded worlds, we began to happen upon pages that were the same and yet different. But because this was a digital object, we knew there was another way in. Code, in this case JavaScript, could provide a map, Malthorpe's organizing logic, and the mechanisms through which that logic was enacted. The rub? None of us read code. Still, we opened the JavaScript file. Though what showed up in pink was clearly text from the website, we were unable to decipher the code. We spent hours reading about JavaScript, but still understood very little. With few other options, we began to experiment. We returned to the pink text, which at least was recognizable. Just to see what would happen, we replaced the pink text, which we now know are JavaScript arrays, with mile markers. We replaced the pink phrases with names and numbers, pressed save, and revisited Reagan Library. What we saw was nothing short of a breakthrough. Our mile markers were embedded in the narrative. Not only had what we had written shown up on the page, it was clear that what made Reagan Library so difficult to understand was that so much of its text is random. With renewed vigor, we explored the HTML files. We began to recognize terms, draw connections, and locate the patterns that unlock for us the basic workings of Reagan Library. So here's how Reagan Library works. There are four narratives, blue, green, black, and red. Each tells the story of a different character. Each narrative is made up of seven chapters. Each chapter is a scene from its story. Each chapter has four stages, which sequentially reveal more about its scene. The blue narrative tells the story of Emily St. Cloud. Emily is grieving for her dead father and tells us of her youth, her experience with psychotherapy, her visions, and her film career. The green narrative hosts a stand-up comedian talking to a psychiatrist, Dr. Chandra. The black narrative contains a prisoner who is sure that he's done something wrong and lit out for the island. He cannot, though, remember how he got here or why he was being punished. The red narrative speaks directly to the reader, evoking a sense that it is your world, that you, like the other characters, are working to figure out where you are and how you got there. Again, there are seven chapters in each narrative, when taken together, make up the character's story, and each of those chapters contain four stages. Now, each of those four stages is an iteration of the same chapter, but with less and less variant text and more and more static text. As a result, chapter one, stage one, makes very little sense, where chapter one, stage four, is perfectly coherent. The hyperlinks on each page, however, are designed so that you can only access chapter one, stage four, where the narrative contains the whole story, once you've already visited stages one, two, and three. The design of Reagan Library is such that the more time you spend with it, the more page four, four, stage four pages you have access to, and thus the more coherent it becomes. Lauren is now going to discuss how we use this knowledge to remix Reagan Library. It can be tempting to ignore new media and electronic literature as humanities scholars because they operate in ways we're not comfortable unpacking. We're drawn to the codex, the poem, the serial, with their predictable paratexts and architectures. It can be hard to decide how to refer to lines within a piece of electronic literature when they are never quite the same. We cannot leave encoding languages to be the sole province of programmers and web, web developers. At the code level, Reagan Library is just as static as any novel or poem. Performing remixes as another scholarly intervention can allow scholars to claim authority over web languages as if they were any other language. So we decided to do a remix of Reagan Library to see if we could learn more about it through getting into its mechanisms and uncovering its expressive processes. Our experiment produced an artifact that revealed how the code expresses and disrupts conventional narrative and operates a lot like poetic forms. Today, I will discuss the process of approaching web coding language as a novice, learning how to read and interpret Reagan Library's JavaScript, 
and how we executed the remix. Ultimately, our project took the opportunity to create questions for further inquiry um, at the same time that we were able to gesture a greater understanding of Reagan Library. We did not have much prior web coding experience before undertaking our remix. As Maggie noted earlier, we knew enough to open the source code for the pages of Reagan Library and peek around, but we didn't know what we were looking at. We were only able to understand the mechanisms and the expressive processes underlying Reagan Library when we started manipulating, experimenting, and improvising within the confines of Stuart Malthorpe's original code. So we took a zip file from the electronic literature collection online of Reagan Library and made a copy of all of the files. From here, we were able to then look at how the hierarchy operated, how the pages related to one another, and how the narrative then came together. We were able to learn everything about the structure through experimentation, through testing things out, rather than relying on any prior knowledge or by acquiring specialized training. First, we created a version of Reagan Library that replaced all of that pink variant text, the JavaScript arrays, with the titles of various functions and the position within the arrays that they referred to. When we then played Reagan Library with these references in place instead of the original text, we were able to see for the first time how the JavaScript arrays operated to construct that narrative and how we might then manipulate these processes to create something new. So if you can't see here is that um, image at the top. Um, so we were not able to experiment with the nominal functions that were embedded in those VR QuickTime panoramas because we replaced those um, with static images. The software they used to build those doesn't really exist anymore. So, so because of this, when we play or read our new version, we sometimes get stuck in loops, something that the arrays embedded in the panorama is prevented from happening. So without getting into the code and altering the narrative text, we may have never realized how much the narrative structure relies on each individual JavaScript array for Reagan Library to function at all. So we hope in the future to be able to make a version that brings this nominal function back into play. For our second intervention, we chose to replace the variant narrative text in those arrays with the text of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And we chose to use Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner because we felt there was a kinship between the two texts and because Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner had enough text to mine for the project. We stripped out Malthrop's um, variant text first and then input lines from the poem that were structurally similar to the fragments that Malthrop used so that, theoretically, sentences that were pieced together between the static text and our new variant text would still make sense. Once this process was complete, we moved on to the original pages. So because we weren't able to alter those VR panoramas, um, and because we were not working with large blocks of prose or a very, very long poem, even though we thought we were working with a long enough poem, our remix is most interesting in the beginning, um, which is the opposite of Reagan Library, um, because there's more randomized text there. It creates these kind of um, flash fictions. So hypertext fictions shift and change, manifesting for individual readers in unique ways. Close readings are contingent on static text, and this methodology does not lend itself to handling electronic literature at the screen level. While some might argue that this proves that electronic literature is undeserving of scholarly consideration, we would argue the opposite. And Rick will now discuss why we propose the remix as a methodology for interpreting electronic literature and other new media work. <clears throat> Video games are attracting more attention from scholars in the humanities. There's an emerging field of study called lidology, which is the study of games. And some lidologists believe that scholars in the humanities are trying to colonize games by foisting their own methodologies onto games, such as narratology. This has resulted in disciplinary turf wars about games. While games and narratives have common features, lidologists suggest that they are just too fundamentally different for narratology to be an adequate method for accommodating the full expressive scope of games. Ironically, while literary criticism on the narratology of games has received a cold reception from lidologists, literary scholars themselves have given a cold reception to electronic literature, which tends to have important gaming elements. New Media scholar Noah Warder Fruin notes that many literary critics have dismissed electronic literature as either narratively weak or too opaque to warrant serious critical inquiry. In Reagan Library, Malthrop uses the phrase crimes against the humanities, sarcastically alluding to the disdain some literary scholars have, have for electronic literature. <clears throat> 
But like much electronic literature, Reagan Library occupies a territory between literature and games. The problem with literary scholars imposing narratology on games and their simultaneous marginalization or perhaps condescending tolerance of electronic literature is that neither response meets electronic literature on its own terms. Literary scholars are not engaging in what Catherine Hales calls media-specific analysis, in which the physical nature of a medium is not incidental, but central to the analysis. In the case of a hypertext novel like Reagan Library, a successful interpretation would account for the novel's materiality, including its images, its fluidity, and its combination of code with natural language. Of course, narratology can be useful for examining the narrative elements of electronic literature, but where it falls short is in its inability to accommodate the interactive and procedural elements of electronic literature. Conversely, lidology can accommodate these elements, however it cannot speak to narrative. We argue that electronic literature as a hybrid genre requires new methods of analysis, and we believe that remixing is a very productive method for engaging electronic literature for the following three reasons. One, it is media specific. Two, it allows us to play the text like an instrument. And three, it gives us a vocabulary to address social and ethical questions typically considered the domain of traditional critical methods. First, remixing is, is media specific. It treats literature not as traditional literature presented in digital form, but as the unique mode of expression that it is, engaging its code and not just its surface output, allowing us insight into the expressive and rhetorical processes that exist at the level of code. Secondly, remixing plays electronic literature like one would play an instrument. Malthrop likens the participatory dynamic of electronic fiction to playing a guitar because it invites engagement and interaction in ways that reward repeated experience, much like a game. This is one reason Wardrop Fruin calls hypertext novels textual instruments. Of course, remixing is nothing new but it is typically associated with music and not literature. Accessing the master tapes or the digital files of a song, arguably the code of the music, enables one to manipulate, reconfigure, and reinterpret the song. Through this type of interaction, remixing broadens and illuminates the expressive scope of a work, which is what electronic fiction invites the reader slash player to do. Remixing Reagan Library highlighted some thematic and structural components of the fiction, for example, central to our experiences are the different ways in which we create, store, and lose memory. The irreverent title of this hypertext novel refers to memory loss, memory storage, and time. In Craig Shirley's biography on Ronald Reagan, Reagan says, we've got to move those trees, metonymically referring to the books in his library. In Reagan Library's narrative, the static texts, since they are coded to repeat, function metonymically as memory. Yet because Reagan Library's code interweaves random sentences into the static text, adding some new text while, dis while discarding old text, that memory is never experienced in the same way, even for the same character. Furthermore, investigating Reagan Library's code strongly suggested code similarity to poetic form. Like code, poetic forms put procedural constraints on what can be said and how it can be said. Rhyme, meter, and stanza are not incidental. They are expressive, and they provide analytical inroads to a poem's meaning. This is what Labor Reagan Library's code provided for us, and one of the reasons we chose to remix it with poetry instead of prose. Finally, there is an ethical and socially useful purpose in remixing. As an interpretive method, remixing offers many of the same ends that critical methods offer literary scholars, only in a much different way. New media theorists such as Wendy Chun, Ian Bogos, and Wardrop Fruin have suggested that understanding the rhetorical, procedural, and expressive capacity of code enables us to understand the social, political, and economic structures that govern every aspect of our lives, including surveillance, commerce, media, advertising, and education, all of which function according to the affordances and constraints of invisible code. Like traditional critical methods, which give us tools to examine invisible ideologies, remixing at the level of code gives us the vocabulary to understand and question these social machineries. Electronic fiction, since it invites engagement rather than discourages it, will compel more teachers, students, and readers slash players 
to interact in socially productive ways.